Among other things, the revolt of 1857 showed the British that uh, the Indian people were united and the Hindus and Muslims had fought together and garnered a unity that had, uh, you know, caused such a huge revolt in such a huge scale. So not only were the British baffled uh, by the presence of these, this Hindu and Muslim unity on the battlefield, but they wanted to do something about it. So here they realized that this unity was to be broken and devised the plan of divide and rule. Now this plan of divide and rule not only, uh, you know, kept growing suspicions about one community or the other, but it also created a great divide between the Hindus and the Muslims and almost was on the verge of dividing the country communally, right? So we see that with uh, you know this kind of a unity growing amongst the masses the british realized that they had to do something about it and that is when they devised this plan of divide and rule now when this plan was devised they uh, you know understood that the muslims uh, were the people who could be incited upon and they incited about the muslims to the hindus now the the entire country was almost communally divided which gave rise to the concept that the Muslim interests was now to be safeguarded for which the Muslim League was established. And with the establishment of Muslim League, we see a different chapter opening up in history that we will learn about. Now, there were several factors that led to the, uh, you know, growth of the Muslim League and also the establishment of the Muslim League. As seen before, that in the revolt of 1857, the unity of the Hindus and Muslims became quite clear. On the other hand, the Wahhabi movement had been, uh, you know, uh, moving forward and it was... Uh, uh, stretched till a point of time in 1857 against the British and the titular head Bahadur Shah Zafar was also the uh, then Mughal ruler of India. Now Bahadur Shah Zafar was taken captive and he was sent to exile in Burma. But what the uh, Britishers realized was the revolt of 1857 was successful on one ground that was on the basis of the unity between the two communities. So here we see that after the revolt of 1857, the Muslims were constantly targeted because of the religion of uh, the Mughal emperor and it was was seen as if it was the Muslims who had created the revolt of 1857 and they were constantly discriminated against by the British who considered Muslims as the main perpetrators behind the revolt. So Bahadur Shah Zafar was taken, captured and was sent to Burma, right? And which caused the end of Mughal sovereignty and the end of Mughal rule. Now, once this entire aspect of uh, discrimination of a particular community was taken upon as a divisive uh, you know, policy of the British, which established as the divide and rule policy, we see that the Muslims slowly and steadily uh, started to move away from the British rule and they started to isolate from the uh, British rule uh, in terms that they were not active uh, in politics also that was raging in the country. So we see that the Muslims become a more closed community so that the British cannot really discriminate against them and they thought that it would be favorable if they moved away from the British and became a close-knit community. So we see that when you know, Muslims started to maintain distance from the British because they also understood that the British had inflicted a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of atrocities on them when the Mughal emperor was exiled and a lot of uh, uh, wealth as well as titles were abolished uh, which w was seen as a religious blow to the Muslims. So as they considered them responsible for the end of the Mughal rule. So the British were considered as the main reason why their Mughal rule had ended. 
now the second point was that the muslims realized or thought the fact that uh, you know because western education had come into the country people were now moving uh, closer to the westernized ideas and did not want the muslim community to do so so we see at this point of time the muslim community moves away from western education as well as modern thought so they lacked modern education which also so became a very negative factor because they were not eligible for any government job on the other hand hindus who were taking to modern education were eligible and they were getting government jobs which automatically created a sort of competition a sort of gap between the two communities so uh, modern education was necessary for government jobs and industrial involvement and british policies kept them economically backward so we see that the it was the idea of the british to uh, drive uh, not only the muslims but also the indians to uh, an amount of backwardness industrially economically uh, politically as well so the muslims did that for themselves and they took to backwardness they lagged behind because the hindus were now getting placed in various british jobs administrative jobs and they were you know uh, uh, they were moving ahead that created the gap as we were discussing so the basic fact here is that not only did they lag behind in the uh, idea of uh, you know gaining more jobs or representation they also lagged behind in the idea of modernity as well as various industrial processes so the hindus who had embraced the modern education had more scope of employment and this widened the gap between the communities so basically the uh, uh, the competition increased the british therefore were automatically able to incite the muslims against the hindus because of this growing gap now after a point of time we see that the british policies towards the muslim quite quickly reversed around 1870s so this policy reversed and became a policy of favoring them which now saw that the hindus were uh, discontent towards the uh, british at this point of time so the british were still sticking to the plan of divide and rule and now were supporting the muslims where they stated the fact that uh, the muslims uh, you know were in fact the people who could uh, give the muslim community a sort of representation and pushed the muslim community towards the entire fact of representing themselves so the british rulers helped the muslim rulers to come together and form a separate organization to keep the muslim away from congress and its national movement so they pushed in fact the muslim community to form a new organization and Uh, they supported the secessionist leaders stating that it was best that the secessionist uh, leaders from their own communities represented the people of those communities so the major factor uh, that played a, an important role was when the call for partition of bengal was given by lord curzon he tried to justify the entire fact by stating that the british were trying to create a place for the muslims that could be a safe haven for the muslims and which would lack the domination of the hindus so this entire aspect of a land different land for muslims was in fact brought up by lord curzon with the partition of bengal so the british tried to justify the partition as uh, creating a safe haven against the hindu domination so in fact we see that some section of uh, the muslim communities were happy with the decision of partition of bengal and in fact welcome the partition of bengal as an opportunity to create a muslim dominated mohammedan province 
and the british here argued that the reactionary and uh, divisive leaders of different religions would be the best representative of their respective communities so they said and they argued that it was only muslims who could represent muslims the best and hindus who could represent hindus the best now another factor that shaped the thoughts and minds of the muslims at this point of time and also people in larger sense in india was how history was being written now the uh, you know brain child uh, about this entire writing of history was that of james mills now who was james mill and what did he do james mill wrote a divisionist history that divided history into three categories first the hindu then the muslim and finally the british so the hindu phase of history was seen to be the ancient golden era where the heroes resided in india when the muslim rule came in india it was seen as a tyrannical rule the rule of the dark ages and finally the british era was the time when the british saved the indian civilization from the hands of the muslims so we see that communal historians were writing communal divisionist histories that projected the hindu period as progressive and muslim period as regressive so the mind behind it was that of james mill who communalized indian history so can you tell me who was the mind behind the communalization of indian history was it james mill William Jones, Thomas Metcalf or Warren Hastings? The correct answer will be James Mill. So in these histories, these communalized histories, we see the depiction of Shivaji as a hero and the Muslim Mughal rulers as the tyrannical rulers who deprived Indians of their true sense of knowledge and victory and glorious past days. So the British depicted Hindu rulers like Shivaji in a better light than Muslim rulers like that of Aurangzeb. Now the entire writing of history actually actually sidelined the the uh, you know picture of a composite diverse culture that india had uh, ingrained in its past which was true to its composite culture so they ignored india's rich composite culture so such distorted versions of history were spread through books posters and media and you can understand that they were popularly represented and people's mind were being affected because of the same at this point of time when assertive nationalism was growing we see that also became a factor that gave a nudge to the muslim community to consider otherwise because you see the program that the assertive nationalists followed to bring the masses closer to the nationalist movement was to revive the india's past uh, you know festivities and past culture but all of these past festivities and past culture which was being revived by uh, you know famous leaders like tilak were all hindu religious festivities now that uh, you know could not gain much importance for the muslims so we see that that not only increased the communal apprehension but it also did not really bind the muslims in nationalistic senses we see that the praise of ancient indian culture was done by the celebration of ganapati and shivaji festivals various programs of purifying oneself with the dip in ganga was being done and invoking the idea of india as a mother and nationalism as a religion which really caused uh, you know uh, something for the hindus which uh, moved the hindus did not find much appeal for the muslims why because uh, in fact if you remember when tagore gave a call for the tying of the rakhi that happens to be a very important festivity for the hindus as a sign of brotherhood that did not find much appeal for the muslims because all these somehow looked like a focus on the hindu religious aspects 
at this point of time we see that various uh, you know leaders muslim leaders who had been in the forefront of the national movement their thoughts also somewhat saw a shift one of the pioneers in the muslim community who worked towards uh, the national movement and believed in the true concept that hindus and muslims were a part of one larger community and you know was based on the fact that it was brotherhood uh, between the hindus and the muslims was known as sir sayed ahmed khan sir sayed ahmed khan was not only a proponent for this unity at one point of time but also a person who brought the muslims closer to modern education but that came with a price that the muslims had to pay however under the influence of theodore beck who was the british principal of mohammedan anglo oriental college which was set up by sir sayed ahmed khan in aligarh the once liberal minded individual sir sayed ahmed khan had now become prejudiced against the hindus sir sir sayed ahmed khan um, you know was was focused to be much more pro british than pro congress so sir sayed ahmed khan moved towards a more anglo muslim uh, policy a more anglo muslim unity than supporting the hindus in the uh, uh, favor of the nationalist movement so the mohammedan anglo oriental college uh, oriental college that was established by sir sayed ahmed khan is now also called the aligarh muslim university as you can see in this picture Can you tell me what was the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College later known as was it Aligarh Muslim University Jadavpur University Alia University or Jamia Millia Islamia the correct answer will be Aligarh Muslim University so there were various contributions as well that sir sayed ahmed khan uh, made at this point of time that in fact uh, you know created the base for the formation of the muslim league sir sayed ahmed khan established the united indian patriotic association in 1888 to counter the congress and protected the muslim interest so they fe so he felt that the muslims were in fact a backward community whose interests had to be protected against the hindus and that is why he established the united indian patriotic association the anglo muslim alliance seemed more viable than the hindu muslim unity to sayed ahmed khan he urged the muslims to cooperate with the british and support continued to the british rule in india on return for preference in government jobs and other advantages so keeping in mind that the muslims had been you know away from modern education for a very long time it had become very difficult for them to uh, you know find representation in government jobs and sayed ahmed khan wanted to bring that aspect forward and therefore he understood it in a manner that if they supported the british and uh, you know uh, remained respectful towards the british then the british will surely hear what the muslim community had to say but there was a change in the air that caused the formation of muslim league at this point of time so first was the incapability of the muslims in getting into government services second british's divide and rule policy third Indian history had been communalized by James Mill and other historians fourth methods of assertive nationalists made the muslims feel marginalized fifth the role of sayed ahmed khan who came to believe that hindus and muslims could not exist together around 1900 there came a controversy which spoke about a new policy that the governor had established in the policy it was stated that hindi would also be one of the official languages that would be taken after urdu
so this created uh, you know a havoc in the muslim community where various leaders saw this as a disrespect to the language of urdu so we see that in the united province this entire controversy arose in 1900 where hindi was declared as the official language along with urdu Moshin ul Mulk, who led the Aligarh movement and was the successor of Sir Syed Ahmed, opposed this order and established the Urdu Defence Association to promote Urdu as the official language. Though later he did come uh, into a debacle with the British regarding the establishment of the official language as Hindi, but Moshin ul Mulk did stick to his entire idea of keeping Urdu as the official language so he also supported the idea of building a separate organization to defend and promote the interests of the muslims so we see that when the partition of Bengal happened, it was justified on the lines that the British were, uh, you know, creating a place specifically for the Muslims away from the domination of the Hindus. Now this was seen as the perfect opportunity for certain Muslim leaders to take up and move ahead for forming another important organization that would look out for the Muslim interests. So we see that that the Bengal partition was justified as a separate province being provided for the Muslims which strengthened the idea of Muslim solidarity for Muslim communities. Many East Bengal Muslims led by Nawab Salimullah of Dhaka supported the partition and had a friendly meeting with Lord Curzon as well. So after uh, the entire meeting with Lord Curzon what gave a big push to the formation of Muslim League was that of Lord Minto's call. So we see Lord Minto appointed Arundel committee to consider the question of extending representative element in the legislative council which promoted the Muslims to put forward their demands to the viceroy. So what this meant was that Lord Minto was actually taking in the secessionist concept of a legislative council that would be divided into separate electorates as the Muslims had wanted for a long time. With the guidance of Mr. Archibald, the president of the Mao College, the Muslims drafted their demands and they took their demands to where? To the Simla delegation. So a delegation of 35 prominent Muslims headed by Aga Khan went to Shimla to meet the Viceroy on October 1st, 1906. And soon these demands also got accepted. But what were these demands that the uh, Muslims wrote down? First uh, was that the Muslim representation in elected bodies considering their political significance and services offered to the government. So a different separate electorate for the Muslims. Second, separate communal electorates for Muslims in provincial Council and the Imperial Legislative Council, which was also very prominent administrative sectors where uh, uh, the Congress was seen to have representation, where Muslims wanted a separate representation other than the Congresses. Reservation of seats for the Muslims in government jobs and appointment of Muslim judges in every high court. So here if you look at the point it actually showcased that they were demanding that Muslim representation be protected and that is why the reservation of seats. Lastly to increase the flow of aid to Muslim universities to bring the Muslim forward and include them in the modern learning techniques. So at this point of time when the Shimla delegation was sent and accepted, we see that the Mohammedan educational conference at Shahbag Dika was also established by the Nawab as he saw the opportunity ripe to establish the very 
um, aspect. The All India Muslim League was formed on 30th December 1906, just after the educational conference, and this was seen to be an organization that supported the Muslims, protected their interests, and also became loyal partners of the British and protected the British in their uh, quest to govern India. So they would be, um, you know, loyal servants of the British in India and would also protect the Muslim interests. So this is Nawab Salimullah, who was the first president of Muslim League and who actually gave a nudge uh, to, uh, you know, the formation of this entire body for the Muslim community. So quickly looking at the objectives of the Muslim League, first was to foster loyalty of Indian Muslims towards the British government and remove any misconceived notion between the two. Second, to defend and promote Muslim interests and respectfully present their needs and aspirations to the government. So to create a dialogue between the British government and the Muslim community. Third was to prevent any feeling of hostility between Muslims and other communities in India so that there are, uh, you know, no communal reactions that the Muslim people had for any other communities. So thus we see that all these objectives showcased how the Muslims were not only trying to safeguard themselves as a community, but also were gaining, uh, you know, a place beside the British so that the British favoured the Muslims. Well, it was not always the case that the British were favouring the Muslims because as we saw that their policies primarily were focused on the entire divide and rule policy. But the creation of Muslim League which stood for, uh, you know, uh, the protection of the Muslim communities and their interest created a larger historical background that would later become a major part in the national movement and would also become one of the major factors that India would have to pay a price for. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly, learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So, at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So, register for free now.